Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, folks. Hey, Ash. Let's give some time for others to join. Let's wait for a couple more minutes and then we can start. Okay, so we can get started uh, as folks join in. So thank you so much for joining this week's meeting of tax security. Uh, just a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube shortly. Your participation in these meetings is an agreement to abide by the CNCF code of conduct. If anybody is willing to scribe for today's meeting, that will be awesome and highly appreciated. Um, so, and please uh, make sure to write your attendance in the meeting notes which you can find in the calendar invite. So with that said, uh, before we start with today's presentation on HEXA, are there any new members who wanna introduce themselves? We see a lot of folks. Uh, I did bring a few friends uh, along for the ride today. Awesome, so yeah. Can let them introduce themselves. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Mark Callahan, um, and I, um, I'm on the product marketing team here at Strata Identity uh, and also working on the, the HEXA project. Warren? Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, my name is Warren Fernandez. Um, I'm an engineer at Strata Identity. I actually used to um, work at um, Pivotal and VMware and contribute to the cluster API project. Uh, um, so uh, finally uh, glad to be back in the CNCF realm again with Hexa. Nice to meet you, everybody. Awesome. Uh, nice to meet you all, too. So before we start, are there any updates uh, from other sub projects? Uh, I saw Radna. OK, she's not here. OK, uh, so. With that, I think we can get started with the presentation. Uh, Jerry, it's all yours. Okay, thanks. And I, I brought one more friend along to, uh, for the ride, Mike Baranek, if you want to uh, quickly intro yourself as well. Uh, sure. I'm a developer on Hexa. Prior to that, I was at Pivotal uh, with Warren, VMware Labs back in the day. So been around platform for a little while. 
All right, awesome. Well, that was actually um, the first part of the agenda. Uh, so we've got those intros out of the way. Uh, the reason we're here today is because we had submitted this project as a sandbox entry and uh, the TOC had reviewed it uh, a few weeks ago and had some questions and issues, which we have here on our agenda. We'll, we'll address those um, as we proceed here. But meanwhile, I also wanted to give uh, this group an overview of, of the project, of what IDQL and HEXA are all about. And we've got a demo for you as well. So we'll walk through some of the repo and actually show you uh, the software in action. Uh, with that, then let's go ahead and uh, get into what IDQL and HEXA are all about. And um, it's, you know, one of our uh, company founders was also a co-author of SAML, the security assertion markup language, which people like Jeff Broberg, I'm sure are quite familiar with uh, from back in the day. So there's a lot of DNA about um, not only supporting industry standards, but actually creating them. And when we looked at um, the sort of cha challenges that our customers were facing, you know, it was definitely a multi-cloud kind of uh, scenario that they were faced with, where uh, surveys that we and others have done show that most medium to large enterprises are trying to manage two, three, four, or more different kinds of cloud service providers in that east-west kind of access, you know, the main ones being Google, Microsoft Azure, and, and Amazon Web Services. And how do you manage con consistent access across that kind of environment when each of these platforms have their own way of managing identity and access policy? And then the situation is compounded when you think north-south, up and down the stack, you know, the application layer, the platform, the data layer, all the, all the data services that are out there, and also down to the network with zero trust, um, software-defined networks, and so on. You know, each of those layers have their own proprietary way to define and manage identity and access policies. So we came up with this notion of identity query language in HEXA as a way to more consistently manage that level of complexity across this kind of very diverse environment. So there's actually two pieces, right? IDQL and HEXA. I like to say they're two sides of a coin where IDQL is the format that we use to, uh, to define the policy. It's a declarative model and it is meant to be able to be translated into and out of the native policies of the target systems that we've and others have built integrations for. <clears throat> and that's where HEXA comes into the picture. So it's an open source reference implementation because we wanted to build software that showed that this, this could actually work. And so HEXA has three main functions, as you see here on the screen. Once we connect to a target environment, then we can do discovery of the policies that exist pull them into the system and we can translate that into IDQL format. So now you've got all of your managed systems uh, access policy in one format within IDQL. Now we can manage it from there. We can make changes and updates and so on. And then we, when, when we want to push that back to the target environments, we go back through HEXA, translate back to the native formats and use orchestration to push that or activate it out in the target systems. So that's what, that's what we've built so far. And we, um, we've started over a year ago uh, by putting together a small team, small working group of, of um, developers, of vendors, uh, enterprise uh, organizations, and some individual contributors to come up to the, this point in time. And <clears throat> we've submitted to CNCF because we're focused on this multi-cloud problem or challenge area, and we felt that the CNCF uh, organization was the best place to foster, you know, additional collaboration, <clears throat> excuse me, development and contributions uh, to the project. And uh, meanwhile, uh, we've talked to other uh, companies, other enterprise companies, other vendors um, out there in the industry, and there's more people that want to join, but are actually waiting for formal CNCF approval because they want to operate under, you know, the um, the umbrella of the CNCF organization. 
<clears throat> All right, so a little bit deeper than, uh, uh, you know, a layer down, if you will. This is a more technical architecture, architecture of what has been built, <clears throat> excuse me. So on the left, you see the, you know, the JSON uh, policy format of IDQL. And then the middle here is, is the, actually the HEXA policy orchestrator. And that is the main component that we're building here. So we will show you in the demo that we have a, you know, a sample administrative UI that calls the HEXA API and uh, is able to manage the environment and you know, connect to the system to do discovery and translation and so on. And Mike is um, really the, the brain power behind this. Mike, do you wanna describe maybe a little bit more about this architecture and, and um, how it works and why it's built this way? Um, sure. So this diagram is also on our GitHub repo. Since um, the initial review, we've done quite a bit of updates to better clarify intentions and whatnot. Um, within the orchestrator, there's an interface, and that interface allows folks to build different providers. So whether it's an app provider via Azure or GCP, or using something like Google's Identity Work Proxy, uh, those are pluggable pieces. I would say, you know, most similar, maybe out and about that I've bumped into is something like Bosch and the cloud provider interface that Bosch was packed with. And that allowed you to orchestrate uh, VMs. And in this case, it's very similar, although we're just orchestrating the policies themselves. So um, the three main methods, if you will, uh, in the middle there. So it's the discover, get policy, set policy um, are the three uh, functions that the interface provides and then the providers implement those methods or those functions. Any questions on that? Uh, so Mike, the, the IDQL JSON that you have on the left, which is the policy, are those, those, do those fields mean something? Like does meta and subject and action in that JSON, do they mean something or it can be any random JSON? Uh, no, they do mean something. And okay. so um, that that is also, um, I guess the input to the orchestrator, right? Mm -hmm. So we're providing a common way to talk about policy. Um, and the example here is that common way to talk about policy. Inside mm -hmm. the provider then, there's a mapping or a translation that happens mm -hmm. to each of the specific uh, policies that the provider may adhere to. And sometimes it's a clean mapping from policy and uh, on the left IDQL to something like um, a policy that Google may have for its identity wear proxy. But sometimes it may actually be um, a sequence of API calls to stitch together that policy. So in the Azure example, we might be modifying the object graph um, uh, to enable uh, that policy. But yeah, the main thing uh, in terms of the IDQL contribution is coming up with a standard way to talk about uh, the different things right, that folks could do as part of a policy. So naturally there's the subject, right. right? There's the action that you could take. There's then the object you're taking the action against. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to, you know, as, as you can imagine, abstract a common policy across all the different, different cloud providers, as right. well as, you know, so if you think of the North, South, and then East, West, Right, we're also trying to tackle things like apps, data, and platform at the same time. So it's fairly ambitious what we're going after. Um, but I think, you know, much like Jerry mentioned in the past, uh, some of the stuff that came out of this crew over the years has been fairly ambitious as well. Defining things like SAML and being part of, you know, some of the early um, uh, definitions of, you know, how we think about security when it comes to applications in that case. Thanks, Mike. Awesome, great. Thanks for that, Mike. So when we look at now the HEXA policy orchestration model here, we think some of the characteristics are, are listed here. Of course, it's open source project. We'll, we'll um, take a look at that in a moment. Uh, we think there's a lot of other uh, characteristics that are helpful for folks. You know, as Mike just said, we're we're dealing with uh, policies across the east-west vector as well as uh, north-south. 
Um, we think it's uh, much simpler to deal with IDQL uh, in a declarative way than it is, of course, to uh, try to translate all of those different um, policy formats that all the environments um, have themselves. Another thing to, to point out here is um, that we are working with a number of other CNCF tools, and I get to more details on that in the uh, in the, the Q and A portion later in our presentation here. But certainly, uh, you know, working with things like uh, Open Policy Agent and Kubernetes, uh, for example. And then uh, benefit wise, you know, the system is designed designed to be agentless and proxyless. We we just call the native APIs that these platforms and systems expose. Um, it allows you to do a distributed policy management or orchestration because we're living in a very distributed world now. You know, a centralized model is just not going to be effective uh, in a multi-cloud distributed world that we uh, live in today. And the IDQL is, um, as we've said before, meant to be universal and declarative so that um, it can work across these different systems and cover you know, a wide range of different kinds of use cases. It, always, it also adheres to the you know, everything as code model and works well in a, in a DevOps, uh, DevSecOps world as well. You know, we've set up our own infrastructure and uh, automation uh, to, uh, to utilize that kind of um, you know, CNCF model, if you will. And I think finally here, it, a key factor that a lot of enterprise customers are interested in is, is breaking that vendor lock-in. So if, uh, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, the proprietary models of access and identity that platforms use do enforce that, that lock-in for customers. And it's difficult for them to move uh, you know, from platform to another or one service to another uh, to take advantage of uh, new capabilities uh, lower cost and so on. And we think in many ways, we help customers to break, uh, break that vendor lock-in. Um, so here's a look at, you know, from a, a PowerPoint perspective of the IDQL model. Um, nothing super innovative here necessarily, but it's meant to be generic and declarative, right? Uh, subject, action, object, or resource within some scope or some condition. And, and context. So we're taking a lot of different vectors into account here. And of course, of course, it can be extended for any kind of edge case um, that might come up. And how, how have we worked so far? Well, we, we Jerry, have a quick question on the previous slide. Yes, of course. So by scope, what kind of scope, what kind of data do you mean? Like, is it any kind of external data or what do you mean by scope? Sure. Uh, so a scope could be, you know, if I'm dealing with uh, database content and I want, um, you know, U.S. citizens or I want, say, a banker to mm -hmm. see only the data uh, within the branch that he or she is assigned to, you know, so that could be a scope, you know, that, that per, you know, customers within a particular branch or other geographic location as one example. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, so how, how have we been operating so far? Well, we've got a pretty diverse uh, set of people involved up until this point. And, you know, some of them are um, just uh, members because they want to support the project. Um, but we have others that are uh, digging in deeper, writing code, reviewing code, uh, reviewing the, the IDQL specs so far. So we're, we're able to accommodate people based on their expertise or just their, their time availability. Um, in, in how they want to uh, support the, the project. So I'm about to switch to a demo. Uh, any further questions at this point? There's a question in the chat. Mark is asking whether scope equals namespace. Well, I think it could, right, uh, Mike? There's no reason yeah, why it, that could it not. Could. Um, again, we're trying to look across as well as going down but yeah it could potentially be namespace but um i guess jerry's example in terms of data what data do you have access to is a good way to maybe think about constraining scope thanks sure enough all right so let's um, look at a bit of demo so you should be able to see the hexaorchestration.org website now mm -hmm. 
And uh, this has some of the same info that I just reviewed from the slides, uh, but also uh, some other some other info here. You know how to join the working group, uh, some of the folks that are currently um, in in the project, but also it has a link directly uh, to the GitHub repo. And just to go back up one level, so the uh, Hexadash org is the you know the higher level entry point here and we have the policy orchestrator and the policy so the policy is the idql uh, the language format and then the orchestrator is the hexa open source and the demo i'm about to show you any of you can download and run this yourselves you know, you just replicate or download the zip, zip file uh, go into the readme here all you need is go pack and docker you know, all the things you can get for free, download it, unzip it, run this pack command, and then this docker compose command, and you'll have a running system. So the idea here is we wanted to uh, give people a way to get started quickly with a working operational system. And here's what's included. Let me go to my docker container. Uh, desktop here. So when you download and, and run uh, those commands, you, you'll get a setup like this. So you have the orchestrator, uh, demo a uh, config server. This is where OPA gets its uh, bundle from. The Hexa demo, this is a, a demonstration uh, business application, very simple one we'll show you in a few moments. Uh, the admin, so this is our example system administrator interface. Uh, we'll show you that as well. Uh, there is an open server bundle because we we use that for um sorry for the uh, demo app to do its own internal access control and also to show how we integrate with an OPA system and uh, there's a proxy that's not used at the moment so that's all you know all what you'll get um, when you download and run the system so you'll have that all local for example and so here this is the sample or example policy administration ui uh, it's pretty simple but uh, again we wanted to have it in here for a full functioning system and this is what we'll uh, use to connect to gcp azure amazon or an opa based system so let's start with um, opa first we just uh, point it to its bundle server hit install and now it recognizes that I've got an open base system available to manage. If I go to the applications tab, then I can get more detail on what's in this package. Uh, so first uh, at the top, we have a display window where we take the, the JSON and, and uh, format it in a more human readable way. And as we'll see in the moment, the four sections here correspond to uh, four tabs within the demo application. So this is the demo app, Hexa Industries. Over here on the left, you see the four tabs that corresponds with uh, the four resource uh, lines from the policy admin. And you look up here in the upper right, you can see that I'm logged in as a member of the sales group. So when I click on these tabs, you'll get a message of whether I have access or not. So obviously I can see the dashboard, I can see the sales tab, I can see accounting, which is probably not right since I'm in sales, so we can fix that. And then HR, sorry, I don't have access to the HR data. So a day in the life, you know, a user admin comes in, uh, sees that uh, sure enough for the accounting resource, uh, the sales group has access. And then down below is where we have the actual uh, IDQL in JSON format. And we can do some simple editing here. So I'll just scroll down to where the, the accounting resource tab is. And right here is that sales group. So I'll just delete that, save it. And now the orchestrator is uh, pushing this out and rebuilding the, the, uh, the bundle for the, uh, the OPA server to pick up. And Mike, I think you've got this set for about three seconds or so that it looks for its um, bundle server. So pretty quickly, we'll see the effect here. So I can still get to the dashboard. 
I can still see the sales tab. And now I can no longer see the accounting and still cannot see the HR tab. So that's uh, phase one of the demo. Any questions about that? No? Okay, awesome. So just to Sorry. clarify, Jerry, uh, just one quick question. So the hex orchestrator translated the JSON into Rego? In this case, no. In this okay. case, the um, IDQL JSON is consumed directly as data input. Okay, and then what's the policy? Uh, the policy is um, interpreting that data. So the, the policy for, um, in this case, OPA um, is represented as data. And then uh -huh. what would normally look like a policy uh, is actually you know, the Rego language or, um, that we're interpreting our data with. Um, so it's a, it's a little okay. bit different when it comes to Rego. Okay. And OPA, um, and mainly maybe the thing to call out: we wanted, you know, a nice five-minute demo that somebody could download and just run locally, uh -huh. without requiring one of the cloud providers. So I think Jerry might do kind of part two of the demo with GCP next. Okay. Um, but it was very intentional to select OPA one to talk about the difference. OPA being, you know, mainly for the decision where mm -hmm. the policy admin is being used as the orchestration or the policy administration yeah. side. Um, but yeah, we're basically pushing out a new Rego, uh, or sorry, a new data file. And the Rego oh. file, um, you could think of, if you're using that is gonna be a package that folks could pull in such that you could interpret yeah. um, uh, IDQL as data. Got it, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so as Mike said, we're also going to connect the policy administration interface to another app. This one is running on uh, GCP. Uh, so the, you know, the, the admin app, of course, is running on my local system here. But let's connect to that GCP instance of the Canary Bank application. So similar to how we connected to an OPA system, we just give it uh, the private key file so it knows where where to find uh, this particular project. And sure enough, we've connected and we can see that Canary Bank demo application. If we go back to the detail list, you can see now we have three different resources uh, from the GCP uh, platform. Cooperate mouse. And if we go back briefly to the app, uh, we use the HR part of this portal to show how we control access to the different regions that the bank operates in. So we have a US region, a UK region, and one for the EU. And this corresponds to, there it goes, this corresponds to the three entries here. Uh, so this one is for the UK. And in this case, we, we uh, show you, again, the display window. Uh, we simplify the JSON format. So you can see that um, the members from initial capacity and, uh, and a couple of individuals, myself included, have access uh, to this region. And just as I did before, I can edit this, for example, to take out my individual entry. Of course, we wouldn't do this in real world. We'd, we'd have roles or groups or other attributes to define users. But for demo purposes, it uh, makes our life easier to do it this way. So it does take a few moments for this to propagate through to the GCP um, plat platform and layers. Uh, while we're doing that, what we can show you is that even though um, we're just on GCP, we're actually using different technologies. I think Mike mentioned before, we're uh, operating behind the identity where proxy, but also you know the US region is using um, App Engine and the other two regions, the EU and the UK are using Kubernetes, as you can see here from, from the naming convention. So if we go back here, uh, ultimately I'll get a deny on the UK. So we'll just wait for 
for that to come through and then we'll move on to some of the the questions that the TOC had posed and it looks like we're about to get that error message now there it is so recognize is my ID and I no longer have access uh, to that page so that's it, it for the demo portion any questions about that no okay what, one thing maybe to just emphasize again, the um, admin screen that you were looking at that Jerry was moving through, that is our demo, right? So the main open source contribution is the orchestrator itself that this is interacting with via um, a REST API. So the intent is, um, you know, folks who adopt and use the policy orchestrator, they may have their own user interface that they then integrate with um to set get policy and naturally you may not be or you shouldn't be modifying uh the json directly right there'd be a, a nicer user interface that allows you to for example remove jerry or you know remove myself from that IDQI policy fair enough thanks mike <clears throat> okay so let's move to some of the questions or comments or issues that uh, the TOC brought up. And I don't know if you all have uh, listened to uh, that video or not, but uh, we, we did capture them here. So one thing they asked is, you know, what, what's the target audience? I think I've touched on this a little bit, but um, you know, it's those individuals that are dealing with the challenge of a multi-cloud uh, world and also up and down the stack. So that could be anyone that's a developer, you know, the system admin who's trying to manage all these policies, the DevEx, DevSecOps people who are trying to automate things, info security, auditing, you know, so there's there's definitely a, a pretty broad and varied audience for, for IDQ on, in Hexa. Uh, because as we've showed, it, it's meant to be, it's, it's designed to uh, be able to translate or map to and from uh, these, these target environments. And we built the uh, the open source to actually show that it could work. And as Mike just said, we've we've added a lot of uh, pieces in here uh, to to pr provide a working system that uh, any new collaborator, any new contributor, could get their hands on and get uh, operational uh, quickly on on their own. So we think the combination here of the IDQL format and the Hexa open source is is a you know great way to simplify managing this very diverse and uh, disparate world. And then we have this question here, um, was there's a number of integrations with other projects that seem to be curious. And it seems that we did distract the TOC, um, again, in this effort to build a complete environment, a complete working demonstration environment. We do have other pieces that uh, we reference or include in the downloads but as mike just mentioned a moment ago the orchestrator is the main component there's other pieces that we build around it for this demo environment like you just saw the admin ui the demo application having an opa server in there uh, so is, is that clear to the security tag at this point that you know we, we have a lot of these other pieces to help make the system operational but they're not you know a core to the project itself Yep, that's clear. Okay, cool. Um, but just to continue, uh, some of the other uh, projects that we do reference. Um, so again, things like Kubernetes. So we use it to run the orchestrator uh, in, in, in a cluster in our demo environment. Uh, we use Contour as the ingress service. Uh, there's another question about Contour uh, coming up. Uh, we use Circ Manager for all of the TLS certs to communicate between the different components. Uh, we do use Harbor as the registry for, for the containers in our own CI CD pipeline and then a concourse uh, used uh, to automate that because as you can imagine, we're deploying this uh, these demo apps across you know, GCP, Amazon, Azure. So we, we found that we needed our own CI CD pipeline to automate, you know, as Mike and team and Warren are making changes to the code, you know, we needed ourselves to automate uh, the distribution of that. And then of course, um, we, we talked about OPA being a part of the demo app and also one of the systems that we're integrating with. Uh, 
one thing maybe to call out so something like contour um that would get replaced with you know maybe the load balancer that's sitting on amazon or the identity or a proxy and whatnot but as jerry mentioned that there's just a lot going on on the infrastructure side to actually prove out that this is actually going to work right and it's pretty amazing you know how far we've been able to go and pretty encouraging um, at times we will try to sit a layer above you know with kubernetes but more often than not we dive into uh, platform specific deployments, whether that be app engine or app services on Azure or even, you know, EKS or EKC or ECS on Amazon. So there's just a huge world when you think about uh, orchestrating policy and, you know, it's N plus one deployments. Sometimes it feels like for each of the cloud providers. Um, and that's not even going, you know, down the stack towards data and networking. So there's a lot there. And yeah, to Jerry's point, I think we posted some of it on the GitHub repo, you know, before the previous session, and maybe it distracted from you know, just the policy orchestrator being the core open source. And my clock was one of those things that we've implemented. Yeah. Uh, do you yeah. want to talk to this one as well? Yeah, we needed something lightweight and uh, the bullet that we put on here, you know, it's really just a stepping stone to a no auth implementation. We need something to secure endpoints when we're not deployed on Kubernetes where we could control more than ingress and egress side of things. So uh, we picked Hawk, which, you know, is a Mozilla project that is kicking around, but um, it's, uh, you know, intended to be replaced with something like OAuth and web tokens moving forward. Uh, but again, that that our core focus isn't you know necessarily that bit right now. It's more around you know can we actually manage and set the policy across the different uh, providers. But that was Hawk. We didn't invent Hawk, or I, I don't think people knew what Hawk was. Um, but yeah, it's just a Mozilla open source project that you know is OAuth ish, right? But a stepping stone for us. Yep. All right. Thanks for that. And then <clears throat> what's the relationship between IDQL and Hexa? I think we covered that um, here today. And then what the question was that, you know, does the sandbox submission include one or both of them? So as we've mentioned, IDQL is the policy format. You know, Hexa is the, the software that makes it operational. We did separate them into the two different repos as you might have uh, caught earlier when I was going through the repos. Uh, sort of similar to what Spiffy Inspire did. Uh, we, we felt that it just made sense to uh, keep them separate, uh, at, at least at this time, in different repositories, but combined, they are the submission for the sandbox entry. Exactly. Yeah. Well, one additional thing, I think folks were looking for a reference to IDQL and the Hexa code base. And it would just simply be the JSON format, right? There's not necessarily a library or anything that's provided via the policy repo or that IDQL repo. Um, so it's us, um, you know, just simply implementing that JSON on the left-hand side that you saw on the earlier uh, slide that represents the IDQL um, side of things. So not necessarily a hard reference to a library, more the JSON format itself. Okay, and then there, <clears throat> there was um, uh, an issue brought up that um, the issues uh, in our backlog have only titles, not much uh, for descriptions. And yeah, that, that is a fault of ours. Yeah, you know, we are operating with a very small team at the moment, so we all sort of know what's, what's going on, what we're talking about. But going forward, we have already started to add more uh, more text and uh, information in the description fields uh, for our issues. So you'll see that going forward here that will definitely improve upon that. Yeah, some of this too is just the life cycle. So early on, um, you know, very much exploring, penciling things in quickly. I think as things mature here a little bit, um, stories will get bigger. A lot of context will be shared via that story. Um, but we wanted to start early, I think, is the main driver. So we you know, got some, uh, you know, almost started at day one, if you will. There was about a few weeks before that initial commit. And so hence some of the small stories, but as we've matured naturally, yeah, we'll get bigger and we wanna give as much context as we can to folks uh, contributing. Um, 
Right. And then on the TSC call, there was this reference uh, that I guess the committee had received about contour. Um, there wasn't any further description. And we don't know what that means. I don't know if this tag uh, knows what that refers to. But again, you know, contour is not a uh, not a deliverable of the project. It's something we use um, within our own CICD pipeline. Sorry. And as Mike said, could be replaced by you know any number of other other things. So I'm not sure how, how relevant that is. And then we've just got some additional reference info, um, the project website that I mentioned, the GitHub repo. Um, uh, Mike uh, led a recording, a, a webcast uh, recently where we talked about some more of the details of the code, how it was built and so on. So I would refer you to that as well. And I think with that, we can open it up to any additional Q&A from, from the group here today. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation, uh, Jerry, Mike, and Warren. I have a few questions, but I'll let other folks chime in first if they have any questions for the team. Okay, I have a question about the coverage you have for translating between each cloud provider's policy and even OPA. As you say, uh, and I have to say, th this tool seems very interesting to me, and I think it's an impressive effort that's <laughs> for starters. But uh, I want to know if you have 100% uh, coverage of everything the other site can do, you can, and anything you can do on your language can be translated into theirs. I, I believe you still have some things to, to maybe finish on that regard, isn't it? Oh, yes. I think we've just skimmed the surface um, so far and um, you know have a lot more work to do that's you know one of the reasons to uh, be part of cncf is to engage with a broader audience so that you know others can come in and contribute their subject matter expertise in, in different aspects of the platform or in, in other other cloud platforms or other uh, services so yeah i think at this stage of our development you know we, we've just skimmed the surface So from the perspective of the security tag, uh, what are you folks expecting from this group? Do yeah, well, the, you know, the, um, the, the oversight committee asked for you all to listen to our presentation, maybe ask some additional questions, you know, and they were looking for some response from right. you. I don't know if it will be privately or, you know, uh, publicly. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think they were looking for you to have some additional input or questions. You know, did we resolve all the questions they brought up on their on their call? And um, yeah, we're just looking, for, you know, for whatever support we need to provide or additional information, and uh, you know, just to understand what is what is the process going forward now. You know, how how do you all interact with the TOC? Right, so typically what we do at the stack is we do a security review of the project. So we coordinate with the team of Hexa and we have our own team as well. And we'll go through this review process where we'll go through your documentation, we'll go through some part of the overall code and we'll uh, find any kind of security vulnerabilities that the project may have. And we create a joint report together and then we give our recommendations to the TOC. So what we can do on our end is we can have like Aradna is on the call, uh, Aradna can chime in, but the chairs can reach out to your team and we can see how we can move this uh, review process forward. So that would be how we would do it at the time. Uh, Aradna, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and obviously we do need a security assessment of this project as well. Um, we'll be happy to take that discussion offline, Gary. Okay. And I think the one maybe reason to bring it up with the crew here is just we're in the security space and sometimes the security space itself is a little bit mysterious in terms of what we're actually up to. And, you know, I think folks who are writing software, they may kick off, you know, an OAuth flow at the beginning of a project, but then they're done, you know, thinking about maybe some of the security right, that most folks think of as top of mind. But I think the reaching out to the crew here is this is, you know, also just uh validation you know being security experts yourself right is 
is this meaningful in terms of our contribution in the security space, right? You know, are we solving real problems? Uh, you know, personally, I, I mean, I this has been a year of my life, so I think we are, and I think it's fairly interesting and coming from, you know, the Cloud Foundry and the little software days, it's pretty fun overall. But I, I think there's, you know, um, just being a security focused application is why they're reaching up to the group here. Um, sure, sounds good. So that, um, Mike, yeah. do you have a threat model already conducted for this or do you need help in getting a threat model in place for this? Uh, yeah, we could use a hand, I believe. Okay, um, so let me run that by um, some of the internal teams here at um, Tax Security and see who can help with that. And th we have a process for security assessment mm -hmm. itself. Um, I will point you to that as well in terms of how to engage the security assessment team and get it going. I think that that will be the next step. And okay. yes, uh, a sub discussion possibly on different use cases, um, a little more in depth discussion will be in order as well. That's one of the future meetings or a separate meeting that we can set up. Yeah, and for us in terms of, you know, the security assessment itself, there, you know, there's things where we're using Hawk intentionally or when we're deploying the Kubernetes, depending on how we terminate things, you know, may uh, we may choose different paths. But um, I think really it, it's back to just this is the security crew and this being a security contribution, I think is the main reason for roping the folks in here as opposed to, you know, should we switch from Hawk to Auth, uh, OAuth or something like that? Right, and, and as part of the review, we'll obviously look at all those things, but I understand the core of the project is the orchestration orchestrator itself. That's right. Yeah, That's right. so I think That's you right. get that. That part is pretty clear. Uh, I believe Mark had some questions. Mark, you wanna go ahead with your questions? Sure, and I think these are all roadmap things. And if you had a slide on roadmap, I missed it. Uh, no, so we did not. Okay, well, there's three things to think about that interest me and maybe other people here. One is, and the namespace thing might be a tip off for this, but it's how to propagate metadata across the policy and group descriptions. This is a big problem for big enterprises where we have, I'm not exaggerating, tens of thousands of groups, some of which are people and groups that don't apply anymore, but they exist in the, <clears throat> in the data structures that are maintaining our policy. So how the metadata gets managed, either as a local property or inherited from third-party metadata managers is something that's of interest to us. So that's just a, an open thought, but feel free to interrupt if you have some thoughts on that particular three. Uh, the other piece that's of interest is how to interop with secrets management, like uh, you know, a Hashi vault or one of those things. Um, there's, as we looked at the APIs, we, uh, people in my day job. As we look to the APIs for that product, which has got public uh, APIs, there's some particular things about policy rate related orchestration within the secrets, like who, when to do the expiring and roll offs and which things get signed, which things don't, which things are high risk, which are not, which you kind of want to have built into the policy engine. Uh, I don't know if that's in scope for you guys, but we keep looking for solutions to help us with that. And kind of related to that, the last thing is, I know you mentioned policy as code, but for big enterprises, there's policy as data. We have products that are trying to sell us commercial tools that will do machine or other kinds of classification engines on the policy data, i.e. treat the policy descriptions as data, try to do classifications, then apply the classification to uh, the descriptions like the ones that Hexa might do for that. So it's an interesting future idea to think about providing a, an open pathway for those tools, which currently don't have one, to take the outputs of those classification attempts to the declarative language that's being offered in Hexa. Yeah, um, that's good. I think I'll take them in reverse. So <clears throat> I think we would be an excellent consumer of uh, that classification data that you just, just described, right? Because if we can then codify that into policies that are you know, distributed out and enforced in the various runtime environments. So we would be a consumer of that. Um, I think for the, the secrets side of things, I don't know, Mike, if you had any thoughts about that. I think in, in similar fashion, we are going to be a consumer of whatever technology is 
you know, best suited to to manage the secrets that we would need as as a hexa system, you know, to connect uh, to these target systems, be able not only to read uh, data that's there, but also update it. Yeah, it's definitely um, top of mind for us, right? We basically we need the keys to things like Google or uh, Azure, right, in terms of knowing tenants and whatnot to be able to orchestrate policy. So it's definitely on our uh, or top of mind for us, you know, mm -hmm. where do we put that? And naturally things like fault pop up and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I think more to come there. It, yeah, there's there's definitely something we're bumping into as we think about how to store, you know, that cred file for GCP. Mm -hmm. the, the value add for you guys is you have a declarative engine that's potentially more nuanced and rich than what the cloud providers are giving us. That could change, but... Yeah, fair enough. And then on the, uh, regarding the metadata, you know, all the group lists and so on. No, I'm sorry, we're not we're not solving that problem. Uh, I know that's one that's been around now for a few decades, and uh, yeah, if we're we're a victim of that. We're not we're not solving that one. Maybe an API to Atlas. I keep putting in my two cents for Atlas. Sounds good. Thanks, okay. guys. Very interesting. Uh, is there question. is there is there a way to folks reach out? Do you have a Slack, or how can people ask more questions if they want to? <clears throat> yeah, we do. <clears throat> excuse me, we do have a Slack. It's not open fully to the public. Okay. Um, although, if you do, what is it, Mark? Info at. Is it on the GitHub Excellent. page or? It is on that, that page, but also if you do info at hexaorchestration.org. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll hit uh, our small working group as well, so we can communicate uh, via that as well. And Ash, or how might we pro provide the slides to you all? I, I don't know if that's a value to share the slides back. Yeah, if you can add the slide link to the GitHub issue, uh, we can okay. then put it in the uh, in the meeting notes. Okay. Okay, we'll do. <clears throat> yeah. And then as far as doing the security assessment, what what does that sort of look like as far as you know timeline and so on? I know Radna, you said there's a, you'll send us a link to that that um, process. Yeah, um, Gary, I will uh, send you the link to the process and uh, also check internally who's available to do a security assessment. They will engage with you and work on a threat model or, uh, and the whole process. Okay. And from there, uh, once they finish, you get like approved as a project. So. Yeah, do we go back to the TOC or does this tag now have authority to approve us? Um, no, approval has to come from them. We only do a security okay. assessment and say here, we've conducted a security assessment. Right? Okay, got it. Thanks. And it's a collab collaborative effort, right? It's not on us. You work with us on getting that thread model in place because we need more information sometimes. Mm -hmm. so, and is the security assessment, is that um, a prereq to getting approved or could we get approved and then you know, if there is any feedback from the security assessment to improve upon? So um, historically, security assessments were done whenever the project was ready, right afterwards sometimes. But I think it's recommended that from my perspective, coming from security background, that first we do security assessment and then approve it as a project. Otherwise, okay. teams will have to reverse engineer and, you know, all that good stuff. And then if you want to know more about the security process itself, like if you go to the tax security GitHub page, there's an assessments folder. So you can check out the older assessments that have been done. Awesome. Uh, we okay. typically start with a self-assessment. So you can check that out too in that same, there's a whole bunch of instructions on how we go about the process. So uh, I would- diff Yeah, right. Uh, so, so Ash, different projects come with a different level of maturity of security assessment too. So mm -hmm. some people go to a great extent to develop their own threat model. So there's minimal work that we have to do then, you know, so, so as much as you can do yourself and bring it to that discussion, I think that'd be very helpful. Okay, maybe we could include a, yeah, something to, to get started there in terms of that model. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay, this is great. Perfect. Thank you so much. So any, any final thoughts from anyone or? Cool. Uh, anyway, thanks so much, Jerry, Mike, and Warren for this presentation. We really appreciate it. And thank you for your time today. Uh, thank have you a as nice well. day. Of... Bye. Okay. Bye. Sounds great. Thank, thank you very much. much. Have a great thank day. Thank you.